the Super Dave at Bleeding Edge. Thank you for joining me for a little special edition here with Throwing Out Tonight. This is going to be me processing my thoughts about the show I saw last night with Getty Lee, his effing life, or as he calls the book, my effing life. <laughs> and just all my altogether thoughts about what's going on with him, what's been going on in the rumor mill for Rush. Uh, obviously a band that kind of doesn't exist at the moment and yeah, just processing things a little bit and and I think for that to be understood um, a little background is important so my relationship with Rush as a fan of theirs goes back to my early teen years my early middle school years when I discovered them and if you've seen my video on 10 albums that changed my life. You'll get to hear a little bit more about that. But when I discovered them through the album Signals and then later Grace Under Pressure, those were kind of my first two albums with Rush. Uh, very quickly after those would have been moving pictures. So that was the core of my initial understanding of them. But really, a lot of what pulled me in and really linked me to them at that early point was the lyrics of Neil Peart, primarily. Uh, that was what first caught me, the intelligence of them, the deep thoughts involved in them, and just the worldview that really seemed to click with me. And I can't say I know why it clicked with me, other than perhaps to an extent, I'm an only child, I had no siblings, and unlike a lot of only child, under child, only children, I had parents who were not helicopter parents who were not over involved in over doting uh, I spent a lot of time around adults because my grandparents lived next door and so I was oftentimes at one or the other houses anyway talking with adults but I just was fiercely independent from the get-go wanting to do things my own way wanting to do what I wanted to do and struggling at times and I still do to understand the impulse that causes people to want to put limits on what others can or cannot do as long as what those things are are not hurting other people or infringing on their rights as well uh, so a lot of what rush talked about really connected with me the idea of, of being fiercely independent but also not just independent but as an individual also accepting responsibility for myself for the outcomes of my decisions and my actions uh, it didn't come across initially as strong in their earlier writings, and Neil's earlier writings, as it did later. But as much as Rush is associated with the idea of individuality and, and individual creativity and independence, there was also a strong current of social responsibility that especially infused their later work, Neil's later writings. Uh, he always did describe himself uh, in his later days as a bleeding heart libertarian. So you're getting that reference. You don't need the explanation. If it's not something that rings a bell immediately, back in the day, and maybe still oftentimes these days, but much more back in the day in the 70s and the 80s, maybe those who were more liberal leaning and more concerned about social causes and social support systems and things like that, liberals would be called bleeding heart liberals. Oh no, you know, and that was a mocking term uh, that more conservative leaning people would use. So, libertarians, of course, are technically a bit more conservative and very freedom oriented and very much into limited government. And <laughs> bleeding hearts are more about I want to help take care of my fellow mankind and I want to be conscious about how I impact the people around me. So, that's that. A little bit of a digression. We went point to geometry. geometry I talk for a living. Geometry class, and we took a tangent. So, but those things really hit me, and it all seemed to make so much sense. You know, it was a matter of, especially a song like Free Will, talking about the idea that people want to blame everything else that goes wrong in their lives on something other than themselves without taking responsibility for their own decisions and their own actions, which oftentimes are the primary contributors to the things that don't go well in our lives, as opposed to simply circumstance. And the fact that, you know, whatever goes down, I want to choose the path of making decisions for myself and having that decision-making power to decide my own fate. So that 
you know, that clicked with me a lot. And I, I think a lot of what comes up often when people talk about what really helped Rush click with a lot of uh, disenfranchised teens or, or disillusioned teens, it's the song Subdivisions as well. You know, a song talking about the idea that if you aren't doing the cool things or being one of the cool people that, you know, your society around you could exclude you and, and could cast you out, as the song says. And for a lot of people, they felt that way. The idea that in the song talking about their, that their parents or whoever or society had predetermined what was going to happen to them and what was the thing that they should do and what they had to do. And Rush was decrying that idea that others would decide for you how your life would be lived. So there, there was that as well that I think connected with me. I wouldn't call myself a rebellious teen. I was not a teen that got into trouble. I was a nerd us rush <laughs> seemed to go together and at the same time i was very quietly um, getting into things that my parents didn't know about um, so much later in life you know i i was uh very much the quiet rebel because i was smart enough to keep myself out of trouble while doing things that would normally get one into trouble if one is caught so there we go but that was my, my primary connection to them at first. And also, they appealed to my darker side in the sense that their, their topics were serious and, and some of their songs were on a darker note, um, or at least seemed that way, things like Witch Hunt and, and all that. But, you know, they weren't poppy, they weren't silly, and they weren't singing about rock and roll that much. So that just all kind of those things appealed to me. And later on, as I became more aware and looked at these things at a different angle they also deeply impressed me for their immaculate skill with their instruments these guys were top flight all three of them in what they did Uh, and two of them arguably the best that ever did it in the rock genre Uh, obviously that's up for debate other people have their their opinions on that and honestly there's a lot of cases where you can say in the top five anybody's interchangeable as far as how you order them uh, because on a given day I could think Chris Squire was better than Getty Lee as a bassist or that Keith Moon or uh, John Bonham would be better drummers than Neil Peart not often on those and Neil by the end had the body of work I think that really helped him lay claim to that title more than they did Unfortunately, that was largely due to the fact that they died young, too. But it is what it is. But it's their musicianship and their dedication to quality that deeply ingrained my my love for them. The ability to produce their music live almost as exactly as it sounded in the album. Obviously, in some later albums, like Power Windows is especially notable in the sense that they intended to make a studio album that was not easily replicated by the three of them on stage. Things changed a little bit down the road and they flexed on that a bit, but up until the early 80s, you heard them live, you heard them on the record, they were dead on. They were dead on and are a lot of bands that could not do it that well. Some bands would sound better live on occasion. Uh, But those were pretty rare. But Rush, at the very least, was consistently as good live as they were in the studio. So you knew it was real. None of this was trickery. None of this was things they did in the studio. This was these three guys making this music themselves. And when you talk about the things that Getty was doing on stage at a particular moment, between the bass and foot pedals and maybe tossing in some keys and singing, man, that's impressive stuff. So... You add that all in, and and that's what really helped me. A lot of that. Later in life, as I became more aware of of who they were and what they were doing and realized that these guys weren't the serious thinkers that I thought they were at times, was cool, you know, to find that they had much more of a sense of humor about themselves and about what they're doing. I, I think... Some of it missed a little bit because, I mean, a lot of folks could point to, well, gee, you know, Getty Lee was on a uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie record singing with them about the Great White North and 10 bucks is 10 bucks. At the time that had come out, I was not really entirely sure who Rush was or who Getty Lee was. 
That was before I got into it. So that one kind of got over my head before I knew what I was looking at, and it was only in retrospect that I began to see and understand. So as I got to know these guys as just cool dudes, you know, who, who were not deadly serious all the time and had some fun to them, and I got to see them live, not just hear recorded uh, live recordings, but see them. Uh, first first concert for me was Power Windows Tour. You know, it was the first time my parents let me go. I probably could have gone earlier, but they didn't want me to drive with the neighbor's kid, blah, 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 whatever. I didn't get to go to Grace Under Pressure. I could have been. But Power Windows, that was what finally was where I got to see them live. It was walked away from that absolutely amazed. Granted, it was my first big concert ever anyway, so I probably was set up to be amazed regardless of who it was, but in particular because it was them. Uh, and then I was a regular at concerts after that. But as I just got to know more about them and understand more about them and, and, and realize that they, they weren't these, these, these rowdy rock stars, these bad guys who were tearing up hotel rooms and getting into trouble. They weren't in and out of rehab and things like that. I began to admire them more and more uh, because they kept it together. Now, I do understand there's some disclosures, so some extra drug use, and, you know, hey, I understood what Passage to Bangkok was about, so I understood they were smoking the ganja a little bit here and there, uh, the, the jazz cabbage, uh, but, you know, like, I knew. I wasn't completely blind to that, but these guys, nonetheless, were, they had their shit together. They were married to, like, high school or college sweethearts, at least I think in Getty and Alex's case they were both high school sweethearts uh niels came in later but it just it, it it was amazing to me that these were just such good dudes and they were doing music that i just so completely admired and it just grew and eventually the documentary came out beyond the lighted stage and that's cemented it if if i i challenge anybody to watch that documentary about rush and come away from that not loving them. <laughs> not thinking these dudes are just awesome, cool people, good people. And to see the influence they had on the world around them, finally. Uh, I know it might seem strange now, but when I was in high school, Rush was not cool at all. Rush was the nerds or the, the geeks or whatever. They were, that, they were the band for them. You know, singing about sci-fi and fantasy-oriented stuff, even though that was only a portion of what they did and they got the high-pitched singing of Getty and yada yada they they weren't classic enough for the classic rock dudes and they weren't hip enough for the metal dudes or hard enough for the metal dudes and they certainly weren't pop music so I took a lot of crap believe it or not for being a Rush fan from a couple of sides and I think probably to an extent that just made me dig my heels in even further on how much I cared about them and loved them. But to see at that point in time when that documentary came out, which was only a little bit before they got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and then you suddenly find out, wait a minute, I wasn't the only one being influenced. And a lot of those people were musicians. So I think in my head, in my heart, I want to be a musician. I never got there because I don't think I had the dedication enough to be very good. But my head is in that space, and musicians love these guys. And then it just grew. And next thing you know, you got Paul Rudd and Jason Siegel in a movie, I Love You Man, which is focused on their mutual love of Rush. And suddenly Rush was cool. And and it's been that way ever since. And for some people, it's always been that way. God bless them. <laughs> you guys, the 80s, the 80s for Rush fans were kind of dark ages in terms of anybody else that wasn't a Rush fan. So fact that they got to where they got and they are held in esteem like they are at this point in time is to me just so heartwarming and amazing and the idea that i could go back in time and tell teenage me guess what dude eventually getty lee is going to have a tv show yes yes if you have not heard paramount plus streaming getty lee bass players are humans too check it out. I'm going to be checking it out. I think it comes out very late in November, early December. I didn't plan on talking about that to that degree, so I didn't look it up ahead of time. But there you go. 
And then we got to the point where all of that crested. And I got to see Alex in the blah, 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 blah speech. If you've never looked up or seen Alex's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction acceptance speech, find it a work of genius on his part. Uh, maybe I'll put a clip in there in the midst of this while I'm thinking about it. But as it goes, you know, then the final tour rolls around. And it's understood that this is probably going to be the final one. This is going to probably be it because Neil's dealing with tendonitis and things like that. At the very least, they won't do tours like this one again. We all imagine something scaled back, something like that. At that point, knowing that concert was rolling around and that my kids, now both old enough, had never seen Rush live. I knew they enjoyed some Rush. Was, but that's kids. But they hadn't seen it. So I decided we were going on that final tour. Just in case that actually was the final, final tour, as it turned out to be. And I decided if I'm going, and I'm going to be in one of those big stadiums, I am not having crap seats. We're getting good seats. This is going to be as close as I can get. 14th row, as close as I could get. VIP ticket. We've got a bunch of swag. Some of it sometimes you might see back there and behind me. All three of us. That was upwards of about thousand dollars for those three tickets, which I know, in comparison to some these days, looking at you, Taylor Swift, that's peanuts. But in 2012, at that point in time, <laughs> that was a ton of money, and certainly factors above anything I'd ever spent on tickets before. I certainly hadn't spent as much on multiple tickets for one of those tickets, much less buying three of them. But it was worth every penny. The kids loved it totally enjoyed it. My daughter had taken bass lessons for a while and had kind of fallen out. It's done and she goes, oh God, it makes me want to take up bass again. They had a blast and it was worth every penny for the memories and for all of that. So I'm glad I did that. A reminder, don't look back and regret the things you didn't do. Even if it's going to cost you some money now. If it's not going to bankrupt you, do it. Have the experience. Enjoy that. And then suddenly going on now four years ago out of the blue it hits Neil Peart has died I was blown away I was knocked out of my chair uh, it was not even of a mind to think that there would be anything to have caused that to happen it was so completely and utterly out of the blue because he wanted it the secret did not want the information public, and that's what happened. You know, it blew up. It was gone. He was done. It was over. My idol, the musician I admired more than anybody, gone. Well, at that point, you know, Rush was over. Because at that point, certainly at least Getty and Alex had pretty much said they had no expectation that they would ever tour again as Rush without Neil. And it wasn't even a matter of tendonitis at this point. It wasn't even a matter of whether he could physically do it. It was a matter of he was gone. And I really don't know that I've got anybody in my life that I knew or didn't know that I would refer to as a hero, but Neil came about as close as you could come. That hit me hard. That, that was I'm not a shame to say. That would be the one time in my life over that, that somebody I didn't know, I shed tears over that. That hit. So... So there we have it. This was the band that I had spent up to that point 30 years of my life. No, 40, pardon me, <laughs> years of my life loving. Almost 40. That's a lot of my life. And, you know, I admired them in almost all ways that one would, I think, like to be able to admire somebody you don't know for their musicianship, for the quality of the music they make, for their dedication to pursuing their own ideals and ideas and their independence the, the lyricism the, the, the skill and the fact that they were good people that I, I didn't have to at any point in time feel embarrassed about their behavior uh, all those things yep, this was my band so with that background here we go 
it's been an interesting week or two because it was only a month ago that the tickets went up for sale that, that Getty was going to do this book tour for My F and Life. That's the title, not meaning to claim it. <laughs> and so instantly I went, I, it's been eight years since I have seen any of them on stage anywhere in person. I'm going to this. I've got to be there. I got to go. I don't know what I'm expecting for somebody on a book tour on stage, but I don't care. I'm going to go see it. This is what's happening. And, you know, as we're coming up to it, you know, and we, we've got the book here. Of course, I got my copy that came with the ticket. So that was easy enough. I will, of course, be reading that in the very near future. Well, starting it in the very near future. Finishing it at the speed I usually do. <laughs> I won't be so near. But then I start hearing and seeing these rumors that there's there's interviews and Getty is suggesting that there may be a possibility of him and Alex getting back together and doing something and even the possibility of them doing it under the name Rush. Okay. Interesting stuff to digest. I know they had got together and played together Rush songs with various drummers at the Taylor Hawkins Benefit Concert or, or, or uh, a benefit concert. Well, I think it was a benefit concert, but that's what we're looking for. Um, tribute concert. There we go. And had a blast with it. And I'm sure that got some things stirred up. And so, okay. Be curious if he's going to talk about this because I, I would have to wonder, is this true? Is this real? Yeah, close of a possibility, is it? And what would have to happen in, in his and Alex's minds, but in particular Getty, since he's the topic here, to allow that, that would, what would have to happen in his mind internally for him to allow himself to move forward on something like that all these years after Neil's passing? So it's an interesting question. It was a, it was a really cool show. This, I'm going to say, I was very glad I went. I had no idea what to expect exactly, but it was actually a really cool time. It was a really cool show. I really felt nice to see Getty live on stage again. Even if he wasn't playing any music, I don't care. It was very cool to see him up there. Um, I saw them at the Met here in Philly area. Uh, it's closest to me. And ups and downs. Let's tangent here slightly. Great venue. It's real it's a gorgeous building it's really nice you know and and it's comfortable seating and all that kind of stuff um I also got mixed feelings about it because live nation venue so that means you're gonna pay through the nose for any drinks you get in there and you're gonna pay an extra premium to get in it because i know last year saw porcupine tree in dc and new york radio city music hall new york those tickets were cheaper than going to see the map here in philly Really? I don't think so. And what it seems that Live Nation did was bought the two closest parking lots to the venue and basically extort a premium from you to put, use them. I think they started at $45 to park. It's now 55 Okay. If I want to walk a half mile, I can park for 12 Thank you very much. So, I, you know, I don't appreciate that stuff and it annoys me about that. Live Nation said it you heard me so but otherwise the Mets are great place it is actually a very cool venue it's a very nice building uh, our guest interviewer uh, we know Paul Rudd had done the first show up in New York a couple days before I think it was the first show we got a guy named Brian Koppelman well he was a cool dude he's a nice dude you know and I think he did a nice job interviewing I think he did it really well because one he is a writer I think he's written books, but I know he's also written TV sh shows, TV series, and things like that. Uh, and he clearly very familiar with the band, so he was really a very good choice. I have no idea if he's from this area or not. I, I probably will have to Google that to find out. I had to Google him just to find out who the hell he was to begin with. I've never heard of him, so it takes away a little bit. We had done all this speculating in the days leading up to it, those of us that were going. Who's going to be our guest interview? Oh, you, you think it could be Mike Portnoy? He lives near here. 
and I'm frequently seeing him at our local concerts at the Met, by the way, um, and other places. So Portnoy, that would be a great choice. You think it could be Portnoy? And uh, then we figured out, oh no, he's in Japan with the winery dog. That's not it. All right, well, who else could it be? Uh, there's a local DJ around here, Preston Elliott, does the biggest morning show in the area. Preston and Steve, he's a huge Rush, Rush fan. So I thought, well, maybe him. Could be him. That would be a good choice. He knows Rush inside and out. Uh, but he could be tied up because they had a big event going on called the Camp Out for Hunger. And I knew he had some stuff going on in the evening. I thought, well, maybe not him. Who else we got? Well, it's only a short hour drive down I-95. Paul Rudd could show up again. Could be him again. I don't know if they'll repeat any of these on the tour. I get the impression they won't. Paul Rudd would have been awesome. Love Paul Rudd. Uh, what's his face? Kevin Smith was from not too far away from here. Red Bank, New Jersey. Could have been him, but I don't know where he lives these days. If he's in California or if he's back in Jersey. I don't know. That would have been cool. Love to have Kevin do that. Because the man knows his stuff cycle all these things through and introduce him Brian Koppelman and we all looked at each other and went who? <laughs> never heard of him he apparently wrote the show or was the showrunner for the show Billions and, and several other things again had to google him but he did a good job because I think that's where his mindset is one that he knew Rush really well and two that he's a guy who I think has some experience interviewing so I think he did a really nice job of helping Getty process and talk through a lot of the stuff. Because to an extent, there there is a level of therapeutic processing going on. If I can step into my other shoes for a moment, that I think Getty's been doing, working through this book and probably doing this tour as well. Um, that part of those those wheels turning in his head that are helping him to move forward, give himself permission to move forward with the concept of working with Alex, playing with Alex again, and maybe doing it under the name Rush. At his age, I mean, and with their history, it's kind of hard to imagine that they would do something that's not Rush. So, that's a thought. So he was cool. The second half of the show, which I didn't realize there might possibly have been two guest interviewers, I don't know that that happened at the New York show. All I know was Rudd was there. Well, kind of close on the one guess. It was not Preston Elliott, but it was in fact the DJ that is the mid-morning guy that's been there at MMR for basically the almost the exact same amount of time that I've been a Rush fan. I was listening to MMR back in the day when Pierre Robert took over the mid-morning slot in like 1982. Maybe 83 at the latest, but I'm pretty certain it's 82. And Pierre is, as far as DJs go, he is a legend. He's probably a legend outside of this town. And so it was exceedingly cool to see Pierre walk out there with his melodious voice and his laid-back, hippie <laughs> persona and all that. And and he was really cool doing the interview with Getty. He's interviewed Getty before. He's spoken with the guys at Rush before. He's spoken with a lot of people before. If you uh, saw a recent photo gallery of, of people that Pierre has met, Rolling Stones to the Beatles to Rush to the Eagles to everybody. Pierre is a legend. God bless. You. God bless you, Pierre. <laughs> God bless you, good citizen. So yeah. And hey, fun fact. I briefly worked with Pierre. Yep, I worked with him personally during my undergraduate internship at WMMR in the early nineties. Pierre almost certainly will not remember. <laughs> that, that's cool. I understand. Uh, but Pierre is in person who he is on the radio, and that's the one thing that's wonderful about him is how genuine he is. So, uh, as things go, it was great to see Pierre there. It really did. He surprised me when he didn't actually know about the nicknames of Lurks and Dirk and Brad. That threw me off. I did not see that coming. I thought for sure he would have known those. Preston, I know, would have known. Preston definitely would have known. And a matter of fact, the two of them, and then you can probably find this on YouTube somewhere. The weekend after Neil passed away, they did a two or three hour tribute on a Saturday afternoon to Neil. The two of them talking about that. So clearly, they know it. And you can find that and watch that and enjoy them doing that. It's, it's really a cool thing they did. So, 
you know, the hosts were great, and I think they did a really good job, and I think they helped Getty be comfortable. And in helping him to be comfortable, they helped him with the process, so to speak. Uh, there was a mixture of them interviewing him, and there was some Q&A from the, from the fans from in attendance there. That's the part that Pierre handled. Brian Koppelman handled the more interview-oriented part of it. And Getty did some uh, reading excerpts a few times in there. And, and nothing, I would say, that was massively relevatory uh, from the book, because I think he wants us to read his book. <laughs> Number one, not read it to us. Number two, some of the stuff of things I already knew. Perhaps a little bit more detail, such as how he came to be called Getty. There was a lot more to that than what I had read in a previous Rush biography written in the 80s. Uh, a lot more detail to that that he was able to share, getting into Yiddish culture and, and more of the family history and things like that. It was really very cool to hear. Uh, a little bit of stories about, you know, how he perceived people reacting to his to Rush's and his music and his singing in the 70s and of course some of those critics and writers were a bit unkind um, yet he responded to them very well I won't reveal that here you can read it or if you're going to one of the shows after this see it uh, or maybe uh, somewhere it ends up online as a video God only knows but there were a number of things going through my head while this was happening. Uh, one, Getty was, as Getty has always been, as I've seen him, as, as humble and as charming and as down-to-earth as I've always perceived him to be. Why would I expect him to change at this point? I would But it was just, you know, Getty was Getty. Getty was the cool dude he's always been. Um, and I give him a lot of credit for the lot of personal stuff that I know he's digging into in this book from what I've heard but also from the things they talked about there. And he talked about some of this stuff live. You know, like, that's not an easy thing to do, to open up like that about some of these things, some of them a little painful and or a little embarrassing and or a little cringy, you know, that he got into live. So there's that opportunity there to feel a little bit more connected to him as he is disclosing about his own stuff and sharing that with us as an audience. Uh, Things like talking about in the early days of their their collaboration in, in one of their early bands that he kind of got fired by Alex and the other guys. <laughs> and confronting Alex about that a little bit, you know, and, and they ended up back together, obviously, and the rest is history. But yeah, there was a period of time when Alex and Getty had played together and split, got back together that there were times when and, and you don't think about it and it doesn't come across because it seems hey he's been married to this one woman for pretty much his entire adult life uh, there were struggles in the marriage you know what there probably shouldn't be a surprise to that when one of this one half of the marriage one half of the couple is traveling a lot is out on tour a lot is not there a lot and you've got children you've got all that other stuff going on so you know fact that he shared that 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 times that was as he described it touch and go you know it's a reminder that these guys are people too sometimes we forget that with these people that we put on pedestals that we idolize that we admire they are people as well one of the reasons i enjoy talking to them is like i love getting to hear about what they're doing but i also like that that human connection you know reminder that these are humans they are people just like the rest of us they have struggles like the rest of us they have doubts you know, and times of turmoil, like the rest of us. And of course, one of the things that I always kind of wondered, and, you know, had I been the interviewer, would have been tempted to ask about a little bit too, maybe in a slightly different context, but the idea that the way the band ended up ending, was there any resentment that, that was there? Because I think that's a natural thing somebody could feel because it wasn't a full band, I think, decision to do what they did in terms of when they, like like these guys had their mortality in front of them at least three times as Rush. First one was early on, and I'd be curious to know how that impacted them, because that's when John Rutsey left the band, or maybe was fired. I'm gonna need to read the book here. I got a hint he didn't leave. He may have been voluntold to leave. 
Um, we'll see. But, you know, at that first point, all right, we're a three piece and we've now lost our drummer. We don't have a drummer anymore and we've just made our first album. And well, what are we going to do? Oh my God. Like we just got started and this is now happening. Holy crap. Like to me, that's a face your mortality as a band moment. Then the next one would have been after Neil lost his daughter and his wife within 10 months in the late 90s. And at that point, Neil was kind of stuck in grief mode for a long time. And there was no certainty that he was going to come back playing, that this band was going to continue. So they were on hiatus for about six years. Um, and the no certainty as to what was going to happen. So at that point, that's facing your mortality. Are we going to continue at all as a band? Are we going to continue without Neil? What's going to happen? And then the third time would be after the R44, after the decision that they're not going to do tours like this anymore. And I had imagined they're left thinking, are we going to record again? Are we going to tour again? What's going to become of us? And then I guess time number four is immediately when Neil's gone. Now it is over. Like there, there's no will he or won't he. It's over. And I think to an extent, I can imagine there being frustration on the part of those who have no control over these events. That have no ability to determine what the outcome is going to be. They are waiting on a friend or they've just lost a friend and, and the decision has been made for them. And... I think most humans might have at least a little bit of resentment in some way, shape, or form. Not necessarily at the person who died or something like that, but at the very least at, at fate, at the powers that be, at, at God or whatever. That they have to work through that. And to an extent, it's kind of hard to imagine some of that frustration and resentment not also being directed at the person. It's, it's a natural thing that humans go through. And it's part of grieving. You know, grief has stages to it. Anger is one of them. So Getty admitted he had to deal with some resentment through some of this stuff. Uh, at, at the initial outset of, oh no, we may not be touring again anymore because Neil has tendonitis. He admitted that that went out the window when he knew Neil's diagnosis was terminal. But, you know, there's still some stuff to work through. And I imagine sense of loyalty to Neil to not want to have Rush continue without him. I imagine most bands that have had somebody die while, you know, they were working. Not while they were working, but, you know, while they were abandoned. Having one of the members pass away and trying to decide, do we continue? Do we do something else? I suppose a bigger band, it's a little easier to say, hey, one of our five people passed away. We're going to have to replace him and move on. But when it's one of three of you and you're as close as the guys in Rush... So I think this is partly Getty processing that and, and, and letting him get some of this stuff out openly and honestly as best as he can rather than holding it in so that maybe he can clear out some of that stuff that might be in the way of him and Alex moving forward. Don't know. They're still non-committal. And of course, I think one of the more moving moments was him talking about his final conversation with Neil and how Neil had been spending time listening to all their old albums, yet he had a habit of not doing that. And Neil was listening to all of the old albums in order, and just processing them, and then looking at them and analyzing them. And they talked about that in that final conversation, and that inspired Getty to do the same, and take a moment and take stock and reflect back on their body of work. And I think to an extent, that's got to be a little cathartic. And, and in some ways maybe inspiring to go back and listen, wow, this is the stuff we did. This is what was cool that we accomplished. And now I want to do more of that. So I can certainly understand uh, if that's where he wants to go. Uh, like a lot of things on, <laughs> in my world, you'll find, I have mixed emotions about the idea of a rush reunion. Uh, I would dearly, dearly, dearly. One of the things that has made me sad in, in recent years is when I think about the fact that I will never have the opportunity to see Rush again. And I still won't have the opportunity to see Rush again as Rush is constituted or always was constituted. Um, 
I have an opportunity maybe to see Alex and Getty play together again. I would love that. Uh, how would I feel about somebody else filling the drum kit? I don't know. Uh, I, in some ways, I feel like it, it may be the only way we can have that and, and experience those guys again and their, their music. Uh, whether they got together and did something different than Rush. Maybe pulled in a couple of other guys and did another band. I find that one hard to conceive of because I, can, I have to imagine that it would be really difficult for them to go out on tour and have people not expect that they're going to play some Rush songs and maybe majoritively want the Rush songs instead of what's new because that's what people do. Uh, there would be a strong pull for them to want to do that and especially at their age. These guys are 70. <laughs> they both turned 70. And, you know, at this point, do you really want to start new with something entirely different? I know Alex has done his work with Envy of None. Uh, I don't know to what degree he is a main motivator in that band versus somebody who is a member of it and playing guitar for them versus creating with them. I have not dug into that to that detail. I don't know. Uh, I've been trying to get interviews with him. Trust me. <laughs> but I don't know. I had to think that if they were going to do anything, I think probably in my mind, yeah. You know, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of the whole concept of the nostalgia act, but you know, given the ages, given what's going on, yeah, I'd be cool with Rush doing that. I'd be cool with Getty and Alex doing that. Who would be drumming? Damn to find them. I can think of a lot of great drummers, and a lot of them have full-time gigs. Uh, I could also imagine that this would be a thing where they just tour periodically with Rush, and can probably fit that in. Names like Gavin Harrison, Mike Portnoy, of course, and Danny Perry uh, come to mind. Uh, I know that Carl Palmer's still out there, and he was contemporary of those guys. He's lost all his mates in his three-piece. He needs two. He's been touring with well, like technological <laughs> replications of them. Um, Getty and Neil, uh, Getty, pardon me, Alex, are missing one, so it almost seems like a perfect match. And then I think, what's going to happen if we've got to talk about these three guys now, not just playing the Rush catalog, but come on, if they're going to play the Emerson, Lake, and Palmer catalog, maybe even Asia, I don't know. Uh, that strikes me as probably a stretch. I, I think it's a stretch. I, I think Carl may be happy trying to do what he's doing, which is a nostalgia kind of thing, and they may want to do their thing which could be a nostalgia thing, and I think putting all of it together could, could stretch some things out. And let's be honest, Getty's voice is not... Uh, Keith, shoot. <laughs> Greg Lake's voice. Went over the wrong name for a second there. Yeah, his, his, his voice is not Greg Lake's voice, so it would be kind of interesting, if not odd, to hear him singing ELP stuff. So I don't know. I, I kind of Part of me wants to say yes. I, I want to see it. And probably that's the strongest part of me because I love these guys. Much as one can love someone you don't know. And I'd love to see them again. Sometime before it's all over for all of us. <laughs> so those are my thoughts. Um, if you are seeing this and they're going to be coming to your city, or rather he's going to be coming to your city, and you haven't gotten tickets yet and you think you are all interested, go get them. Trust me, it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. And and even up to the last day before the show in Philly, there were some tickets for resale at reasonable prices. So I expect that's possible in other places. If you can't do that, get his book. You know, like, sounds like the excerpts he read? <laughs> He's a good writer. And I understand there's some really amazing stuff in here. Um, writing, like, about the family history that his parents who had survived the Holocaust... And all that is, I understand, a really moving portion of the book that he does some really good work with. And just what I heard him doing, he, he writes with a great sense of humor uh, and, and a good turn of phrase. So I, it sounds like, at least from what I've heard up to this point, I'm going to enjoy this book. And I think a lot of people that care about Rush or Getty or whatever would enjoy it as well. So is that a recommendation? No, because I haven't read the book. <laughs> I can't say it's a recommendation. I haven't read the damn thing. Uh, is it a expected recommendation? Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. And I don't know if it's something that's exclusive to those that have the connection to Rush that I have. 
or if it's going to be something accessible to others or not. I don't know. I'm going to hope to find out the coming year. 2024 will represent the uh, 50th anniversary year of Russia's debut album. I plan to do some stuff with that. That's all I'm going to say at this point in time until I figure out whether I can actually pull off what I have in mind. We'll see what happens. Anyway, that's me doing my processing of Getty, doing his processing. It was a great time. It was a really cool show. All of us enjoyed it. I recommend that. That I can recommend. But for right now, just my thoughts. You know what? If, if you are a Rush fan, please, I, I hope you like this. Comment. Let's talk. Let's chat about this. I, I'm curious other people's perspectives and thoughts on this. Um, I'd really like to know what the rest of you think about the potential of a Rush reunion. Uh, and your thoughts. And what are your connections to Rush? You know, why are you a fan of the band, assuming you are? Why are you not a fan of the band if you're not? If it's just not knowing them, dude, get out and know them. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Anyway, I'm done rambling for this portion of time. If you haven't seen my other stuff, if you just came across this as your first thing, hey, most of what I do is interview interviews. I interview artists who produce progressive rock, progressive metal, prog metal, prog rock, whatever you want to call it. Check out the interviews. I, I talked to a lot of big names recently. Pretty big names happy to say so you can check that out it's in podcast format leading edge interviews wherever you get the podcast or you found the channel now so hey if you could like subscribe hit the bell you can follow along do some reaction videos to spice things up in between and and do some other things a little bit here and there once in a while i process my thoughts on something and i'll throw in a few top 10 lists or stuff like that here and there as i can if you could follow along it'd be fun and if you enjoy progressive rock progressive metal all that kind of stuff Head to Live 365, check out my channel, The Expanse. It's got 24-7 of all that proggy goodness. If you like that, you're going to like the channel, I think. Anyway, that's all I've got for you right now. This is Super Dave, signing off.